Hey, my friends. Thank you for joining me for tonight's Midweek Moment. And I have to tell you again, I appreciate being able to spend some time with you looking into the Word of God. Uh, before we get started tonight, I want to encourage you to share the Midweek Moment. And then I want to remind you that this Sunday we are starting our World Missions Week. It is the most important week in our church calendar, and it's the week that I get the most excited about. This year our project is training leaders and building churches in the country of Ecuador. New Life has built over 60 churches around the world, and now we're going to bring churches and leadership training to the country of Ecuador. If you'd like to participate in that, we would encourage you to call the church office or you can log on to our website and just follow the giving links and you can designate a financial gift so that we can leave a spiritual legacy through this effort. Thank you very much in advance for that. And tonight I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit and how he deals with the world. If you remember the last two weeks we looked at Jesus speaking to his disciples about the importance of love. And even though he told them they have to love one another and love people, he also told them that they would be hated. And remember we said that when they hate us because of Jesus, not to take it personal. I mean, if you think about it, they hated Jesus and he was perfect. So why do we think everybody's going to like us or love us? And then he begins chapter 16 where he left off in chapter 15. And that's where I want to jump in tonight. Chapter 16, verse number 1. I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith, for you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. Wow, that's powerful. This is because they have never known the Father or me. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm giving you a heads up. I'm letting you know what you're in for, and when it happens to you, so you won't abandon your faith or turn your back on me and walk away. Sometimes when we're under pressure, we have a tendency to want to walk away and abandon our faith. And Jesus said, don't do that. I'm letting you know in advance what's going to happen. And then in verse number five, here's what he tells us. But now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I go away, then I will send him to you. Remember in chapter 14, Jesus talked about sending the Holy Spirit. Here he is reminding them again that when he leaves, he's not going to leave them alone. He is sending the Holy Spirit. Help is on the way. Remember the Holy Spirit is our helper. He's our teacher, he's our guide, he reminds us of the things that Jesus told us and taught us. So it's impossible for us to live for Jesus, it's impossible for us and for them to endure the difficult times in life without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. My friend, I wanna remind you again, we need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit has a specific assignment to us as believers and a specific assignment to the world or to unbelievers. Tonight I want to look at his assignment to the world and then next Wednesday night we'll talk about his assignment to us. First of all, he convicts the world of sin. And we read that in the eighth verse. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. We all, we all have a def definition of sin, but I like to define sin as a willful disobedience against God. It's willfully choosing to disobey God. It's, it's rejecting Jesus, and Jesus tells us the biggest sin of the world is rejecting him is refusing to believe in him. Unbelief is the height of any and all rebellion against Jesus Christ. 
Today people say, well, I don't need to believe in Jesus. I, I practice other religions or I'm a, I'm a good person or, you know, I wouldn't think of doing this and I always think of doing good things to my neighbor. Can I tell you, it's good to do nice things for your neighbor. But we have to remember that those things don't earn salvation, that those things don't earn eternal credit with God. And, you know, we knew Paul blew that theory out of the water when he wrote to the Roman church because Paul told the Romans, as the scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one person. And he went on to tell them that all of us have sinned and we've fallen short of God's glorious standard. So there is no excuse. Uh, there is one way to God, and it's through Jesus, and we need his forgiveness and his redemption because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the Holy Spirit, his assignment to the world or to unbelievers is to convict them of sin. So until there is an awareness of sin, there will be no repentance and no salvation. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts the world of sin. And then we're told here that he convicts of God's righteousness. We read that again in verse number eight. He said, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness. Righteousness means the state of being morally right. God is righteous. God is holy. It means being in the right standing or relationship with God. Our righteousness, according to Paul, falls short of God's standard. But when we accept Christ, his righteousness is imputed or imparted to us. So we see here that the Holy Spirit shows or reveals people what their righteousness looks like, or I should say their unrighteousness looks like, compared to the righteousness of God. He doesn't compare us to other people. He compares us only to Jesus. You know, it's like, it's like trying to use monopoly money. It works great in a game, but it doesn't work in the real world. And we can't, we can't think that our righteousness is going to be adequate to cover the, the imperfections in our life or the fact that we fall short of God's standard. And then thirdly, he says he convicts of coming judgment. And he tells us that again in verse number eight. And of the coming judgment, of the coming judgment. No one likes talking about judgment. When we talk about judgment, what do people say? Well, you're being judgmental. Well, you're being judgmental. You shouldn't be judgmental. Well, I get that. But that doesn't change the fact that judgment is coming. I mean, judgment is eventually coming to all of us. And there is a, there is a price to pay for rejecting Jesus. There is a price to pay for rebelling against the things of God. There's a price to pay for choosing to do things that are clearly unscriptural and immoral. I mean, think about this. Uh, we have laws in our country, and if you break the law, at least in some places, if you break the law, there's punishment. If we break the law, we are put in jail or we're punished in some way. And uh, we need to understand that there are, is authority that we have to be accountable to. And people in authority who allow serious crimes to go unpunished are making a terrible mistake. But God doesn't operate like that. God is perfect and God is holy and God has a standard. And God says that if you reject my son, if you willingly choose to rebel against me, eventually you're going to have to pay the fiddler. There's a price to be paid. And he lovingly sends the Holy Spirit to remind an unbelieving world, a rebellious world, an immoral world, that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, and that they can have a personal relationship with him and be forgiven for their crime or their sins against him. I mean, it's pretty simple when you think about it. But when a non-believer is truly under conviction, he will see the foolishness of his belief. He will feel conviction in his heart. He will confess that he doesn't measure up to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he will realize that he's under condemnation. 
the Holy Spirit helps that person repent and helps that person accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I remember when I was an unbeliever, and I remember the Holy Spirit bringing conviction into my life. I remember the Holy Spirit reminding me that God's standard was here and I was living down here. And because of the Holy Spirit drawing me to Jesus, I gave my heart to Him. He changed my life and I've never looked back. The Holy Spirit is important to the believer and to the unbeliever. Listen, thanks for tuning in tonight. I appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing you in one of our services. 9.15 or 11.15, have a great week.